Hey everyone. <clears throat> um, I think I'll just dive in and read. Is that right? Is that okay? Yeah, I think yes. that's all right. Yep. Um, yeah, I'm glad to be with you all. Um, I wish I was there in in um, person. I'm going to read about um, for about 20 minutes, I think, maybe 25 minutes, and then um, Diane and I are going to have a, a conversation a little bit, and then I think there are going to be questions that you all can ask some questions if you wanted to. Um, and I'm just going to um, move through this book a little bit, this book catalog, of Bash Gratitude. I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about how the book came to be or, you know, other questions about it. I, I might, I might talk a little bit about it in the meantime, but anyway, I just feel lucky, glad, that, grateful that you all um, read it or have it or can have it if you want. This is called, um, this is a poem called To the Fig Tree on, on Ninth and Christian. This is a, uh, in Philadelphia, this is a sort of a true story. I was walking down the street um, <clears throat> and I just came across, I saw there was a woman sweeping um, figs up off of the sidewalk because there were so many figs falling from this tree in Philadelphia that it was attracting all kinds of yellow jackets and stuff. So she had the task. <laughs> <laughs> probably gonna last for a few weeks of like sweeping up things and I had never um I had never had that experience um or witnessed that or witnessed such a thing and anyway this is kind of that's kind of the origin point of this poem it's called the fig to the fig tree on ninth and Christian tumbling through the city in my mind Without once looking up, the racket and the lug work, probably rehearsing some stupid thing I said or did, some crime or other. The city, they say, is a lonely place until, yes, the sound of sweeping and a woman, yes, with a broom, which now, beneath which you are now too, the canopy of a fig, its arms pulling the September sun to it. And she has a hose too, and so works hard rinsing and scrubbing the sidewalk, lest some poor sod slip on the silk of a fig and break his hip and not probably reach over to gobble up the perpetrator. The light catches the veins in her hands when I ask about the tree, they flutter in the air and she says, take as much as you can, please help me. So I load my pockets and my mouth and she points to the step ladder to me and take more, please. But I was without a sack. And so my meager plunder would have to suffice. And an old woman whom gravity was pulling into the earth loosed one from a low slung branch and its eye wept like hers, which she dabbed with a kerchief as she cleaved the fig with what remained of her teeth. And soon there were eight or nine people gathered beneath the tree, looking into it like a constellation pointing. Do you see it? And I am tall and so good for these things. And a bald man even told me so when I grabbed three or four for him reaching into the giddy throngs of yellow jackets, sugar stone, which he only pointed to smiling and rubbing his stomach. I mean, he was really rubbing his stomach. Like there was a baby in there. It was hot. His head shone while he offered recipes to the group using words which I couldn't understand. And besides, I was a little tipsy on the dance of the velvety heart rolling in my mouth, pulling me down and down into the oldest countries of my body, where I ate my first fig from the hand of a man who escaped his country by swimming through the night and maybe never said more than five words to me at once, but gave me figs. And a man on his way to work hops twice to reach at last his fig, which he smiles at and calls baby. Come here, baby, he says, and blows a kiss to the tree, which everyone knows cannot grow this far north, being Mediterranean and favoring the rocky sun-baked soils of Jordan and Sicily. But no one told the fig tree or the immigrants there's a way the fig tree grows and grows. It wants, it seems, to hold us. Yes, I am anthropomorphizing, God damn it. I have twice in the last 30 seconds rubbed my sweaty forearm against someone else's sweaty elbow, gleeful eating out of each other's hands on Christian Street in Philadelphia, a city like most, which has murdered its own people. This is true. 
We are feeding each other from a tree at the corner of Christian and Ninth. Strangers maybe never again. This poem is called Ode to Buttoning and Unbuttoning My Shirt. And the uh, there's a line in here where I say, um, this is not something to be taken lightly. And in my head, I'm riffing um, or um, acknowledging or calling into the poem, the poet Nazim Hikmet, Turkish poet, um, you know, kind of mid, mid 20th century Turkish poet who was um, incarcerated. He was a communist. He was a political prisoner for years. And he would write these, some, you know, some of the most beautiful poems, love poems, and they were, um, you know, he might be writing about a, you know, a, a tree or his beloved or something outside. And he would say things like, this is not something to be taken lightly. Ode to buttoning and unbuttoning my shirt. <clears throat> no one knew, or at least I didn't know they knew what the thin discs threaded here on my shirt might give me in terms of joy. This is not something to be taken lightly. The gift of buttoning one's shirt slowly top to bottom or bottom to top, or sometimes the buttons will be on the other side and I'm a woman that morning. Slipping the glass through its slot, I tread differently that day or some of it anyway. My conversations are different and the car bomb slicing the air and the people in it for a quarter mile and the honeybee's legs furred with pollen mean another thing to me than on the other days, which too have been drizzled in this simplest of joys in this world of spaceships and subatomic this and that two, maybe three times a day. Some days I have the distinct pleasure of slowly untethering the one side from the other, which is like unbuckling a stack of vertebrae with delicacy. For I must only use the tips of my fingers with which I will one day close my mother's eyes. This is as delicate as we can be in this life, practicing like this, giving the raft of our hands to the clumsy spider and blowing soft until she lifts her damp heft and crawls off. We practice like this, pushing the seed into the earth, like this, first in the morning, then at night, we practice sliding the bones home. This poem is called, um, oh, did that go? This is called Spoon, and this is for my friend Don Belton, um, beautiful writer, teacher. Um, yeah, our beloved friend, Don Bell. Who sits like this on the kitchen floor at two in the morning, turning over and over the small silent body in his hands with his eyes closed, fingering the ornate tendrils of ivy cast delicately into the spoon that came home with me eight months ago from a potluck next door during which the birthday boy, so lush on smoke and drink and cake, made like a baby and slept on the floor with his thumb in his mouth until he stumbled through my garden to my house the next morning where I was frying up stovetop sweet potato biscuits and making himself at home as was his way. After sampling one of my bricks, told me I could add some baking powder to his and could I put on some coffee and turn up the Nina Simone and rub maybe his feet, which I did, the baking powder, stirring it in. And I like to think, unlikely though it is, those were the finest biscuits Don ever ate. For there was organic coconut oil and syrup bought from a hollering man at the market who wears a rainbow cap and dances to, to disguise his sorrow. And it might be a ridiculous wish, but the sweet potatoes came from a colony just beyond my back door, smothering with their vines the grass and doing their part to make my yard look ragged and wild to untrained eyes. 
the kale and chard so rampant, some stalks unbeknownst drooped into the straw mulch. And the cherry tomatoes shone like ornaments on a drunken Christmas tree and the blackberry vines gnawed through their rusty half-ass trellis, this in Indiana, where I'm really not from. Where for years, Negroes weren't even allowed entry and where the rest stop graffiti might confirm the endurance of such sentiments. And when I worried about this to Don on a cool September evening, worried it might look, Don in his kindness, abundant and floral, knowing my anxiety before I stated it, having been around, having gone antiquing in Martinsville a few weeks back and been addressed most unkindly by a passing truck or two, knowing the typhoon's race makes our minds do, twirling with one hand a dreadlock and patting my back with the other, he asked, smiling sadly and knowingly, niggerish, before saying, it looks beautiful, and returning to some rumination on the garden boy of his dreams, whose shorts were very short and stomach taut and oily enough to see his reflection in. Don told me this as we walked arm in arm through our small neighborhood, which he asked me if he could do. Is this okay? He asked, knowing mostly how dense and dumb and how dense and sharp the dumb fear of mostly straight boys can be. Oh, Don. Walking arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder, his hand almost patting my forearm, resting there down the small alley next to the graveyard, fall beginning to shudder into the leaves. And Don once dreamt he was in that graveyard next to his house on 4th Street, where in real life we sang Diana Ross is missing you while decorating his kitchen. Where I once asked to borrow a signed Jamaica Kincaid novel at which Don made one sound by sucking his teeth that indicated I was both impossibly stupid and a little bit cute. And in Don's dream in the graveyard where century old oak trees looked like giants trudging into a stiff wind and some gravestones are old enough to be illegible and they lean back as though consulting the sun. Don was floating into the air, which pleasant at first became terrifying, he told me, beginning to cry just a little as the world beneath him grew smaller and smaller, his house becoming a toy, the tree's huge limbs like the arms now of small people calling him down. But he couldn't stop going higher, he said, crying, just a little. And I've inserted myself two or three times into the dream imagining a rope cinched to his waist by which Don might be tethered to this world, snatching it as it whips uncoiling through the grass at my feet and gripping it with all of my strength until it almost hauls me up and takes the skin of my palms with it, twisting slowly into the sky at which I become like the trees here on earth shouting, come back, come back. Running down 4th Street, some blocks down, looking into the sky, but as the wind sends him this way and that, I too veer through backyards, hopping a fence or two, not wanting to take my eyes from him, not wanting to lose him. As he sails in and out of the low clouds, looking down with his sad eyes, just as he did when he said at breakfast, I'm a survivor, I survived. This 53-year-old gay black man to which we did a little dance, listing the myriad bullets he dodged, swirling the biscuits in their oily syrup, Don occasionally poking his fork into the air for emphasis, laughing and sipping coffee and shaking our heads like we couldn't believe it. And having survived, Don wanted a child to love. And we made plans that I might make the baby with my sweetie and he could be the real dad, reading and cooking and worrying while I played in the garden and my sweetheart made the dough, which maybe would have worked, though Don never once cleaned a dish, 
And when I told him to put his goddamn plate in the sink, he writhed in his seat and called me bitch before plopping it in, returning to his destiny's child tune about survival while he scooped and slurped the remaining batter with his spoon, with this spoon in my hands, into which I stare, seeing none of this. I swore when I got into this poem, I would convert this sorrow into some kind of honey with the little musics I can sometimes make with these scribbled artifacts of our desolation. I can't even make a metaphor of my reflection upside down and barely visible on the spoon. I wish one single thing made sense. To which I say, oh, get over yourself. That's not the point. After Don was murdered, I dreamt of him, hugging him and saying, you have to go now fixing his scarf and pulling his wool overcoat snug, weeping and tugging down his furry Russian cap to protect his ears, kissing his eyes and cheeks again and again, you have to go, cinching his coat tight by the lapels for which Don peered at me again with those sad eyes, or through me, or into me, the way my dead do sometimes, looking straight into their homes, which hopefully have flowers in a vase on a big wooden table and a comfortable chair or two and huge windows through which light pours to wash clean and make a touch less awful, but forever otherwise will hurt. I think I'll read two or three more poems. Three more poems. This is called Ode to Sleeping in My Clothes. And one of the things I think is kind of interesting about this book, it's called Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude, as you know. But the original title, as I was sort of pulling together the poems that were going to be this book, as I was probably halfway through it, it was going to be called Ode, um, Ode to the Mundane World, riffing on uh, the poet Pablo Neruda's book, um, elemental oaths and um, things change and maybe that'll come up in our conversation but there's a lot of odes in the book Ode to Sleeping in My Clothes and though I don't mention it to my mothers to my mother or the doctors with their white coats it is in fact a great source of happiness for me as I don't even remove my socks and will sometimes even pull up my hood and slide my hands deep in my pockets and probably more so than usual, look as if something bad has happened. My heart blasting a last somersault or some artery parting like curtains in a theater while the cavalry of blood comes charging through. Except unlike so many of the dead, I must be smiling there in my denim and cotton sarcophagus slightly rank from the day. It is said that Shostakovich slept with a packed suitcase beneath his bed. And it is said that black people were snatched from dark streets and made experiments of. And you and I both have family whose life savings are tucked 12 feet beneath the Norway maple whose roots splay like the bones in the foot of a man who has worked, who has walked to Youngstown, Ohio from Arkansas without sleeping or keeping his name. And it's a miracle, maybe, I almost never think of to rise like this and simply by sliding my feet into my boots while the water for coffee gathers its song be in the garden, we're on the stoop, running almost from nothing. This is called Becoming a Horse. And you know, like, this is just like a, I might not need to say this, but I haven't spent a lot of time around horses. <laughs> And a dear friend of ours uh, here in, in Bloomington 
um, lived with some horses to on and off two or three horses. And it was the first time that I kind of got close to horses. And, you know, the, um, my family, half of my family is from Minnesota and my, um, mother's family were farmers and some of them farmed actually with horses, um, back in the day, I'm pretty sure when my mother was very little, um, but in my growing up, I had no relationship to horses. So anyway, this is a little bit about the first, my first encounter, friendship with a horse. Becoming a horse. It was dragging my hands along its belly, loosing the bit and wiping the spit from its mouth made me a snatch of grass in the thing's maw, a fly tasting his ear. It was touching my nose to his made me know the clover's bloom. My wet eye to his made me know the long field secrets. But it was putting my heart to the horse's heart that made me know the sorrow of horses, the sorrow of a brook creasing a field, the maggot turning in its corpse made me forsake my thumbs for the sheen of unshod hooves. And in this way, drop my torches. And in this way, drop my knives, feel the small song in my chest swell and my coat glisten and twitch and my face grow long. And these words cast off at last for the slow, honest tongue of horses. And then one more poem. And this is called um, Ode to Drinking Water from My Hands. And this is my, um, this is very much a Verndale, Minnesota poem. This takes place at the little cemetery in town there. Ode to Drinking Water from My Hands. That's the memory anyway. That's the first line of poem too. Ode to Drinking Water from My Hands, which today in the garden, I'd forgotten I'd known and more forgotten I'd learned and was taught this by my grandfather, who in the midst of arranging and watering the small bouquets on mostly the freshest graves, saw my thirst and cranked the rusty red pump bringing forth from what sounded like the gravelly throat of an animal, a frigid torrent. And with his hands, he made a lagoon from which he drank. And then I drank before he cranked it again, making of my hands now a fountain in which I can see the silty bottom drifting while I drink and drink. And my grandfather waters the flowers on the graves among which are his and his wife's unfinished and patient, glistening after he rinses the bird shit from his wife's and the pump exhales and I drink to the bottom of my fountain and join him in his work. Thank you very much. Oops. Okay, thank you, Ross. You're oh, very welcome. It is such a gift to hear a poet read their own work. Mm, yeah. You know, it, 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 it gives you a sense of the <clears throat> the real rhythm in it. The yeah. it changes the meaning of it when you hear it in the writer's voice. Yeah. So um, it just and so I'm just I just so enjoyed hearing those poems read out loud. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I wanted to just uh, say to the White Bear Lake Art Center my appreciation for <clears throat> the invitation to be here tonight in conversation with Ross. Um, we first met this summer, actually, up at the Northwoods Writers Conference, and that's where I learned that you do have some Minnesota. You're practically Minnesotan. <laughs> <laughs> practically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can say you betcha. Or... Oh, yeah, I can say it all. I can say it all. <laughs> you know, it's funny because uh, I had a friend of mine um, who's from New Orleans transcribing my um this book that's coming out in a week and he was transcribed. So I'd be reading the essays to him from the page and he'd type them in. 
and he's he's really from New Orleans, and he would I would say things, and <laughs> I, I would be maybe quoting my mother or just saying other things, and like a you betcha, and he might be yeah. like, "What are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> Where are you from? <laughs> Where are you from?" <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, I've heard from family who've moved away too that their their accents come back, you oh, know, yeah, when you're yeah. thinking or visiting. And so yeah. um yeah, that was that was fun to learn that you do have some some family connections here. Yeah. Um so I I just wanted to start with a question about our gardens, because mm -hmm. <clears throat> that is something I think that you and I as writers really hold dear in our yeah. work. Yeah. And I was just curious, what was um, most remarkable about this season for you? Oh, great question. One thing is that um, we've been very sort of diligent about, I think, um, not only paying attention to the hummingbirds, but like facilitating, you know, growing stuff that they love. And um, in addition to having a couple of hummingbird theaters, you know, I put in a bunch of uh, um, scarlet runner beans with the red flowers. They just love those. And for whatever reason, I'd never actually grown zinnia from seeds. And so there's just a lot of zinnia. I actually have this bed that I'm very proud of. Um, <laughs> I'm shy to say I'm proud of things, but I'm proud of yeah. this bed that I made. And it's a sweet potato bed. And right when I put in the sweet potato slips, you know, for people who haven't grown sweet potatoes, it's basically a kind of a stem or a sweet potato um um, a little cutting off of a sprout off of a sweet potato. So you basically put a little plug into the ground. And at the same time as I put that in, I seed it all around so that I gave the zinnias just enough time. And these are the most rambunctious sweet potatoes, but there's all these zinnias growing out of them. Beautiful. It's a beautiful bed. I feel like, ah, oh, that's the best painting I'll ever make. You know. Oh, and I bet you get a ton of bees and hummingbirds yes. and everybody's coming by just Everyone's appreciating. Busy. Yes, yes. That's, that's really yeah. Lovely. That's like, that's the, that's applause. In the yeah. Palm. Oh yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> How about you? What is, what is uh, most fascinating or exciting? So this is the year, even though we've had an extremely dry year, um, the wild grapes are as happy as can be. Yeah. So, so somebody, some plant is always happy. Someone's not happy. It's, it's oh. like a family, you know? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and then yesterday I have a, a sedum and it just reminded me of the importance of having blooming plants this time of year. There mm. were 15 bees on it. Oh. Like, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I felt, I felt I'd succeeded as a gardener in that moment. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> So the uh, one of the questions that I'm always curious about with other writers, when you think about the this universe of ideas that's always swirling around out there, mm -hmm. so why this book at mm -hmm. that time? And yeah. I was curious, just because we're it's the twelfth today, but it's like we're right in that long shadow of nine eleven, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you must have been writing this within a couple years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh no! Well, within a decade, I guess it was yeah, a within a decade. Time. Yeah, but, yeah. But what was it that? Um, where did this this book grow out of for you? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Like I was saying, um, somehow, and I'm not sure. It may have been that my friends, some of my dear friends, were writing odes, but I got the ode bug, and I started okay. writing. <laughs> and I started writing odes. Um, and it was, you know, I was, read, I was reading a lot of Neruda, but my friend Adeseli, my friend Patrick Rosal, like a lot of these other poets who I love were also writing odes. And I kind of got in the spirit and I was writing, you know, the ode to drinking water from my hands or to the mulberry tree or to the fig tree or, the, you know. Um, also, I was gardening a lot. And I think that probably had a lot. Gardening newly. I was gardening sort of, this book emerges from, if I wrote this book around starting around 2010 ish, um, it's or at the beginning of my garden life and the kind of like enthusiasm that being a new gardener. I mean, I was so locked in. <laughs> all I did was read garden books, and that's like uh, that's all I <laughs> did. 
watch video garden, you know, YouTube was new. So I was watching garden videos all the time. You joined the cult. I joined the cult fully, fully. And I was, but I was watching all these, or I was reading all this garden and stuff. And, and so I was writing, I think I was writing poems about the garden, but I also had this thing, and it sort of feels sort of important in the, in the way that this book came to pass. I was at a reading, a really beautiful reading where folk, where not the, the sort of, um, the, the poems of young poets, of young poets, like, you know, like just, just beneath me, like sort of if I was at a two book poet, these were folks about to have first books and beautiful poets. And they had a kind of necessary and beautiful, you know, rage, et cetera. But at some point I sort of felt like, oh, you know, there is this other um, register that I'm, I'm sort of, I think I'm longing for. And the register is like, you know, gratitude. <laughs> um, and it, and it, and I wasn't like formulating it gratitude in the most complicated sense, which is how I think of gratitude. I think of, I don't think of gratitude as being a simplistic thing. Um, and also I want to say, I wasn't like thinking of it. I think I was sort of feeling it, you know, and kind of in retrospect, I can kind of see, but I remember coming out of that reading with these you know, beautiful young writers. And I remember a plainest day, I was working out in a field and I said, oh, I'm going to call my next book Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude. Almost as a kind of um, oh. acknowledgement and antagonism, I think, as in like, a, you know, and, um, but then I had to write a poem called Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude. Oh. Um, and the poem that I read tonight, Spoon, came after I decided that. And there's a poem called The Opening. So the three longest poems in that book came after I made that decision, they're also three of the most sort of like deeply complicated, difficult poems. And I feel like it's important, like um, Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude, in addition to talking about like so much of our lives, the last, the kind of last image is of a dream where a little girl is pointing to the roiling sky coming at us, like so many, um, whatever, I can't remember, but sort of it's coming and it's, you know, and sooner than we think, yes, and so, you know, and so so I kind of mean to that this gratitude is a gratitude uh, in the midst of pro profound sorrow and yeah. profound trouble. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's a long that's a long answer. <laughs> no, and this is good. This is this is what for me was really um, what was really pulling me in was this this um joining oh you had a great phrase uh let me see if i can find it um well there were two lines that i just called out because i could really feel your your appreciation for what the garden had given you but mm -hmm. then also there were those lines and one was that loving what every second goes away yeah. which is yeah. part of what you had just talked about because boy that that poem just hit me hard the yeah. you know the but it's but you have a way of you punch but then you hold up you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. and and i felt like in that um in that way of crafting your poems th that we we don't look away but we're also held yeah. in in how we can um move through these things yeah and so um and the another line that I really uh, appreciated was in the factory where loss makes all things beautiful grow, mm -hmm. and the um, and so it's this. It was seeing in your poems how you intertwine gratitude and sorrow so beautifully, mm -hmm. and then also together with the garden. And I wondered if if would you mind just ex expanding a little bit more on that gratitude and sorrow, the way you weave them together, and how you came to that. Yeah, um, that craft. Yeah, I think um, that thinking about gratitude, and which I think of is also thinking about joy. I sort of think of like the it's like gratitude, joy, love are these three things that kind of interchangeable almost in certain ways. But gratitude is to me, it's the um, it's the kind of practice of acknowledging and remembering that we are beholden to all which makes our lives possible at all um at the very least you know that's the very least that we're gonna we're gra grateful for and grateful for the for what makes your life possible and what makes you know everything that we love possible 
which is a kind of endless, is a kind of an endless thing. Um, you could never come to the end of that catalog. And that, you know, I think one of the things about a garden is that it's not at all the only place, but a garden's a really useful place to kind of study that. Yes. You know, you can kind of like be, you know, if you're watching, if you're watching it, if you're not at war, you know, I think there's definitely a kind of, you know, if we think of like, you know, uh, conventional agriculture, which uh -huh. is poisonous, destructive <laughs> agriculture. <laughs> we, you know, uh, the whole GMOC thing, the whole, all of it. Yeah. As uh -huh. you know, uh, um, that's one mode. And that is a mode of, you know, I think it was like a mode of unlife. But this other mode of, of gardening where you're sort of like, even the thing that you just said, like something's always happy and something's always a little bit grumpy. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> like there's, right. When it's dry, when, it, you know, there's no rain. Well, what is going to like, what is going to love this? What's going to thrive in this? That's a kind of like witness, but also to be like, oh, a kind of gratitude. Mm -hmm. To me, is that's a gratitude to the wild grape. Mm -hmm. For, for the capacity um, and probably also for teaching us how to like be in the in the drought. Mm -hmm. um, and I can go on and on. Like when you talk about the pollinators, it's like, all you have to do is watch, like we have a lot of mountain mint and there are in this, when it's sunny out and the the, the number of pollinators on this mountain mint, I mean, it's hundreds or, th I mean, it could be thousands. And they're yeah. all kinds of, a lot of honeybees, but they're these beautiful black, they look like spaceships, you know, they're just like, <laughs> oh my God, they're, you know, uh -huh. these wasps that are just like, they're so beautiful and you kind of want to yeah. touch them, you're like, better not touch that thing. Yeah. Um, on and on. And it's hard to watch that, to, to witness that and not be, I mean, you really got to be working hard and not be like, whoa, there are some mysteries afoot that yeah. I do not understand, but I think they're keeping me alive. Yeah. Yeah. You know, why this? Why now? Why you? Yes. Uh, but something's yeah. working. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And it's such a great testament to diversity. That's it. Yeah. That it, that's it too. That's it too. Yeah. So, uh, um, I was also curious when you think about gratitude, does that include a sense of responsibility for whatever's inciting your your gratitude? This is the thing. I'm trying to work out the the language for it. Some kid, some young woman asked at a reading recently. She said something like, um, "What I it, this the feeling that I think is a common feeling." And she's a young teacher um, and has a nice setup. Like evidently has like a garden at school and has like you know a good playground or whatever. And she was like, "Sometimes when I'm playing, when we're out in the garden and experience having this lovely experience, I can feel guilty." for oh. that other people don't have access to this. Oh. And and we were kind of like, well, what what if the feeling was gratitude? Mm -hmm. um, partly because I'm, I kind of think that if gratitude is in fact attending to the ways that we and everything lovely that is happening is made possible, not by our own like virtuousness or deservedness, mm -hmm. because there are things loving us and caring for us some many of which we could sort of figure out and articulate, many of which we cannot. It, I think it inclines us to share in the simplest way. Mm -hmm. If we're being cared for, it inclines us to care. Oh, that's oh, that's what it is, care. Yeah. You know, yeah. and almost in the simplest way. And the the again, the sort of like, I do feel like it's important. Sometimes I'm sh I'm shy or reluctant to articulate the negative thing in part because I kind of want to like let that, let's just like let that go to sleep. But there is something that's so pervasive. I think the the alternative thing, like in a garden, to be like to dominate the garden mm -hmm. and to corral everything and to like be at war in the garden, you know, that's just like battling, you know, people are battling in their gardens yep. um, and farms and every everything else. That's a mode of life that is is not full of gratitude, clearly. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a mode of life that does not imagine that there are things outside of that, that probably imagines whatever it the inputs they control, whatever the ways that they can you know dominate the plants, etc. It's all up to them, you know. 
Whereas there are all these other ways of living um, and imagining, I think, that make it plain that, you know, I mean, just like acknowledge, plainly acknowledge that it's not actually the case. The mm -hmm. case is that at, there's so much sort of caring for us. And to practice witnessing that, I just feel like very simply, it inclines us to kind of join in. Yeah. To join in, you know? Yeah. It's, it, to me, it's that lesson of reciprocity. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I've heard people talk about, you know, gratitude as, well, you simply accept the gift. Yeah. And, and in my mind, if you accept the gift, you have a responsibility for that gift. Totally. And that, so that's, I'm, so it's always curious to me where, how people hold that sense of gratitude. Yeah. In what yeah. they do in the garden or in their lives. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you for the, for sharing on that. Um, yeah, and could you say like how you hold that gift? What's the next thing? So so in the garden, for example, yeah. the um, you were talking about the okra and the yeah. peppers that are coming, yeah. right? Yeah. And so you're receiving a gift of food, yeah. and in the in the teaching of reciprocity, you give back by providing healthy soil yeah good organic fertilizer water yeah. appreciating the food sharing the food keeping the yeah. seeds or whatever you do so it's that sharing it's yeah. that what you mentioned it's care yeah. it's the caring for and it always goes both ways and some yeah. you know like you were saying sometimes people are at war yeah. with their garden yeah. or you know yeah. the world around us poison it just yeah. you know dominate it yeah yeah. And it's sort of the refusal to be in that relationship of sharing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's it's no wonder that if if we disavow our indebtedness to the earth, if we disavow our beholdenness fundamental to the earth, that we would be inclined to hoard. Like, I'm not going to share my peppers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the earth right. had nothing to do with it. The earth right. had nothing to do with it. It was all me. Yeah, all me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. But you know, it's usually like most most the gardeners I know. Even my friend Kate came over the other day. She had like a haul of habanero peppers and some some yeah. other peppers. And it's just like that's a lot of. I find that a lot of gardeners like we learned that thing. Yes. You know? like, got lucky. Got if blessed. You were, if you were in Minnesota, I'd be dropping off some wild grapes to you tomorrow. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd get some. You'd get some peppers and some greens. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to mention to the audience that I have more questions, but if you would like to participate in this conversation, just drop them in the chat and I can, um, uh, I can bring them up. But um, in the meantime, um, I was also wondering, because, you know, one of the things I so appreciate about your work, and I, I did go and um, also read um, inciting joy and the book of delights and i'm looking forward to your new book mm -hmm. but this the the way in which you hold immense sorrow and loss and violence and racism but but against that you're always pushing back with joy and gratitude and delight and <clears throat> and i find that so in contrast to what media is doing these mm -hmm. days especially around you know, climate and our relationship with the earth, which is glaciers melting, wildfires out of control, flooding. And these are all, uh, I'm not saying that it's not important to know that, but I'm saying if that's all we hear, what um, it has a, it, it can have the impact of disconnecting us then from that relationship. And I was wondering, what are you hearing or what are you intuiting about that? And, um, can you just uh, talk about how your 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 recent work about joy is also a survival strategy for the future? Yeah, yeah. I it's you know uh, you know how it is. You write a book and then you kind of after you've written the book, you kind of learn later how to yeah. talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Other people help you. Yeah, yeah. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> And I've sort of been, after I wrote that inciting joy, the sort of language that I use at the beginning of the book, which I wrote last in the introduction, is that joy is sort of what, what sort of 
you know, radiates from us when we help each other carry our sorrows. And I believe that's part of it. Um, that seems to me true. Um, and in this case, it could be, you know, the sorrows of like, um, of the unknown, the sorrows of like, um, trouble, or trouble, you know, um, but the, the, the way that I feel is maybe a better way to articulate it is how we practice our entanglement, you know, like joy is like what the, the act of practicing entanglement, um, which again is sort of like why it's joyous not only to chip in on your friend's garden and to like help them put in a couple of new beds or to like plant trees in a community orchard or like with a crew or whatever, but it's also joyous to be at the memorial, you know, it's also, it's also joyous to like, you know, um, when it's time for people to leave to like be with them and like help them go. Um, it's, because that is also the evidence of our entanglement, you know? And I feel like, you know, my relationship to, um, I feel like there's a vested interest in in a lot of media, et cetera, to foment disconnection. I think that's sort of like, I think it I says, agree. and I think there's something, <laughs> there's something, I don't know, like provocative about, you know, there's a writer named Chris Hedges who has a great book called War is a Force that Gives Us Meaning. <clears throat> and it's a it's a profound critique of that, but it's an observation. And I feel like there's a way that it's not the only thing, but I feel like it's a powerful thing. And I feel like a lot of um, media, et cetera, uh, sort of works on that model. And I'm very interested in like sort of spending time noticing, identifying, learning from all of these communities, all of these people, maybe not communities, maybe just like people walking by each other on the street who figure out ways to care for one another, mm -hmm. you know, which are everywhere. I mean, it's everywhere, if, you know, if, but I feel like you kind of have to like put the glasses on. You have to get those glasses. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And I have, you know, and I have, there are writers, there's someone named Sadia Hartman who has a book called Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments. And it's a book about, Black women, young Black women from the 1890s to 1940s in Philly and New York. And she's talking about these various strategies that they had to sort of invent, basically, to sort of survive the particular kind of brutalities that were um, in place. And it's a, it's a book about, as she sometimes says, her work is about describing things. Hmm. And that's so interesting to me. I feel like, oh, let me just... Um, I feel like Rebecca Solnit's very good at that, the writer Rebecca Solnit. Like, let me just describe or try to get better at describing not the devastation ongoing and uh, oncoming. Um, there's enough people doing that. <laughs> yeah. Let me describe the way that people feed each other. Yeah. That's yeah. really, it happens every day. Yeah. It's never on the news. <laughs> <laughs> and don't you feel too when you walk outside? I mean, there's there's so much beauty around yes. it. There's so yes. many, like you were describing your hummingbirds and your zinnias and your sweet potato vines. And if we're so disconnected from that relationship and only thinking about glaciers, yes. we can't take care of who's still here, that's who's it. around us right now. That's it. That's it. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. There's, there's still a lot of relatives out there who need yes. us. That's it. That's it. Yeah. I have a question for you from the chat. Yeah. Um, as a poet and writer, what would you tell your younger self um, <laughs> for some advice for budding poets? Yeah. You know, um, someone just asked that question. And I, I, the thing that I feel like I believe, um, is to just like study, study what you love, you know, is to, and I feel like that's a little bit to your point. I'm glad you said connection several times tonight. And that's, that's the thing that I feel like is, that's the thing, like practicing connection, witnessing connection, understanding connection, trying to understand connection, which is there, even if we don't understand it. I mean, we're just going to suffer if we don't, if we don't pay attention to it and don't join it. And I feel like 
I have struggled as a person for various reasons, I think, um, with believing in and articulating and noticing connection. I feel like there are ways that I've spent a lot of my writing life looking for disconnection. And I feel like not only would I have had a sort of a happier, um, and I don't mean like happy, happy, I mean like sort of a deeply satisfying um, writing life. I feel like I would have spent less time. I feel like I would have had more fun as a writer, actually. Um, I know that the way that I sort of approach my writing now, which is about, I mean, I'm if I if I don't love it, I'm not, I'm not interested, you know. Um, I was just writing a little piece of about a little music piece about music. And I was just like, I love this so much. And I and I feel like there's a way that the writing can be more fun if that's actually what you're up to. You know, yeah. you're trying to like understand what you love. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I would tell my my young self. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you want to tell us a little bit about your new book coming out in a week? And oh, yeah. Um, I and I am curious uh, how, as a poet, I mean, you've had what three books in a row now for, that are all essays. Well, two books in a row, and then one. Is that right? Yeah, two books, essays, and then a book of poems right before that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. But but just as a poet, what does um, the essay form? You know, how does how does that work for you differently than poetry? And then what's your new book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, actually three of my last four books are essays. Um, it's, it's, uh, I, I feel like I came up as a poet and I feel like there are certain habits or, or things that I've learned as a poet that I bring into essays. And, and I think, um, like I have a very strong relationship to music and language. I have a very strong relationship to like, um, you know, like I'm, I'm about beautiful sentences. You like, I want sentences to sound like something. I want them to unfold in a way that is not only musical, but it's sort of like, um, I kind of want to say cognitively musical that make your, makes a song of your mind in a way. I was going to say makes a song in your mind, but I think makes a song of your mind, of your thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a way that I think those things I've kind of tried to bring over to the essay writing. And there are moments where I'll see in the essays, um, you know, like an iambic, straight iambic pentameter, you know, and I know in the revision process, it was close to that. And I was like, oh, I'm going to make this an iambic line mm -hmm. as a way for me to like, just put a little bell on the thing. Like, read this, read this a little extra. <laughs> <you know? laughs> I'm also like fascinated with images um, in a way that I think I learned as a, as a poet um but essays i feel like um i feel like there's something a little bit more open about the essay form and you know i say this kind of regularly when i learned that essay just meant attempt or try i thought oh essay is anything yeah yeah and and whereas poems i i have i know enough about poetry that i sort of have even even when i'm not thinking about it I have a kind of, I'm deep in the tradition in a way. And I have a kind of lineage and I have a kind of like idea about what a poem is. Though I've read a lot, a lot of essays, I still keep that feeling of like, well, that's it can be anything, you know? I don't know if I think a poem can be anything. Um, and I and I also don't know if that's the case. Uh, you know, I'm also kind of like, I wonder, maybe this is tomorrow, we'll talk again and then we'll see if it's- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, new question, new, new answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the new book is, uh, it's called The Book of More Delights, you know, uh, and uh, it's 80, I think 81 um, new essays. It was just like, I wrote it five years after I wrote the first one. Um, and I thought my buddy of mine asked me when I finished the first one, you're going to keep writing those delights. And I thought, oh, it'd be an interesting book. I like very long projects. I also like mm -hmm. serial projects, um, mm -hmm. painters who do, you know, something with the same title again and again and again. And um I thought, oh, this could be a fun thing to do every so many years. And five seemed like a kind of reasonable amount of time. And so it's an interesting, it's a really interesting book. And it might not be surprising that one of the subjects is actually aging, you know? Ah, yes. 
yeah. <laughs> uh huh. So, and how does it differ from your first one? I mean, do you feel five years ago? So, yeah, you're I mean, there are those things. It's like when I said it's sort of one of the subjects is is aging. Like I'm, my mother has a different role in this book. You know, oh, she, she yeah. was seventy eight. Now, well, she was seventy seven. Now she's eighty two. Um, yeah. I was forty two. Now I'm forty nine. You know, um, yeah. like all of these, some people are gone who were here. You know, yeah. something, you know, my, my Nana dies in the process of writing the book. My Aunt Verna dies in the process of writing the book. Like, um, there's a kind of, there's that thing. Um, yeah, I, I can say that. that. That's what I'll say. Then okay. we'll see what other people think is different about it. Okay, yeah. so that comes out in a week, which is exactly. fabulous news for all of us. Um, and we're right about at eight. So I just wanted to offer one last appreciation, Ross, for um, the gift that you give us as readers in your work. And I think in, you know, myself having the time to really sit with this, with this book, the catalog of unabashed gratitude, and how generous you are in writing about, um, like in the, the opening poem, and in the catalog of uh, the title poem and about your dad and you know grief is one of those experiences that cuts across everyone we all suffer loss and grief at some point in our life and I feel like um, this is such a book of um, wisdom and also comfort mm -hmm. in a way that you just say um, when you're faced with those moments just to hunker down to be mm -hmm. with it and I just, I so appreciated that. And I'm so grateful to, um, for the work that you've put out in the world. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Yeah, I'm so I feel lucky to get to have this conversation. Me too. Mm -hmm. yeah. First of many, first of many. Yes, exactly. Yes. So I don't know if um, the, uh, uh, Katie, okay, Katie is back with us. Thank you guys so much. We really appreciate it. Anybody want to clap? Yay. <laughs> yeah. Also, thank you for hosting this. Thank you for yeah. hosting this. Yeah. Yay. Our in person group. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Bye bye. -bye.